there's some pretty big overlap here with uh, my video on uh, inductors acting like toddlers. But I wanted to go over um, some things about self-induction. So let's imagine that you have a uh, current that's coming this way. What happens is, is that current goes around, it's going to create a magnetic field. In this case, if the current's coming from left to right as drawn, that's going to, using your right hand rule, create a magnetic field that points to the left. But we also know from Faraday's law of induction that a changing magnetic field causes, obviously, a change in the magnetic flux. Again, flux, if you don't remember, is similar to magnetic field, but it's actually magnetic field times area. Strictly speaking, the dot product of the magnetic field vector, the area vector, um, it doesn't have a little circle around the integral because it's not a closed surface. If you were to do that, it would always add up to zero. Uh, and the negative of that. It's a mathy way of saying it wants to oppose the change. So if the magnetic field changes because the current is changing. And remember, you can't change current instantaneously. It always takes some amount of time. That's also, as this magnetic field changes, changing the magnetic flux through this solenoid, which is then going to change the voltage or the uh, induced EMF. And it's always going to oppose that change. So let's say that this B is increasing, for example. Uh, what that's going to do is that's going to uh, induce a magnetic field inside of here that opposes that change. So that would be sort of like a B induced. And since the current's trying to increase, that induced voltage is always going to oppose the change. So if you're trying to increase the current to the right, the induced voltage is going to uh, go to the left. And you can convince yourself of this with the right-hand rule if we were to imagine a current going this way, even though one doesn't actually uh, go that way, and you were to curl your fingers around, you would indeed get that induced magnetic field going to the right. As long as you've got it here, let's look at it from the uh, other perspective. Here you have the eye coming in this way, and coming around and sort of out this way. So we're looking at it as if you're looking from the right side of the first picture. And as that happens, the magnetic field is going to be going away from you. So this is, you know, for, because the current um, is going in that direction, is going to be creating a magnetic field going into the page in the center here, and no magnetic field outside of it. At least if it was a perfect solenoid here, it's just a model, and there's only three loops to make it easier to see. That's going to create an uh, induced magnetic field that's going to oppose that change. Because the magnetic field, the green, is getting more and more into the page, that's going to induce a magnetic field out of the page. So sort of circles like that. Uh, to do that, that's going to create uh, a voltage, an induced voltage, as if this is the positive end and this is the negative end down there, opposing that change. So let's take a minute here uh, and go qualitatively through um, the different situations with increasing and decreasing current. And then we'll look at uh, how we get the equation for the self-inductance of, of a solenoid. Before we derive the formula for the inductance of a solenoid, uh, I think it'd be a good idea if you look at this table, we have I for current and E L for the uh, voltage across the inductor. And for each of the other columns, you're going to either put right or left. And in the case of the magnetic field, you can also write increasing or decreasing if you like. And uh, I'll go through them pretty quickly. So in the first case, we have the current going to the right, and then you know it would go up like that. And by the right hand rule, that would give us uh, a magnetic field that was pointing to the left and increasing as the current increases. Well, if the magnetic field increases, that's also going to increase the rate of change of the flux. So the uh, flux is going to be coming more leftward. The induced magnetic field has to oppose that change, so it has to go to the right. 
And you could look at this one of two ways. Number one, inductors just want to fight whatever you're changing. So I know the current is increasing to the right, so I've got to have an electric um, EMF that's going to the left to oppose that change. But I also can think about it from the magnetic field perspective. If the B, uh, sorry, the B is going to the left, I need an induced B that's going to the right. So to do that, given the position of the, or at least the way this curls, we're gonna need a current to go this way and curl our fingers over the top from behind to create a magnetic field going this way. So let's look at the next one. If I is decreasing to the right, that also means you're going to still have the magnetic field to the left and it's gonna be decreasing as the current decreases. The change in the magnetic field is going to actually be to the right now because a magnetic field to the left but decreasing is a change to the right, much like a ball thrown up in the air going up, but decreasing in speed is an acceleration or a change in velocity that's actually down, that's, that's opposite. And the induced magnetic field has to oppose that, so it has to go to the left. And for the uh, E of the inductor, the EL here, since it's a decreasing current to the right, uh, it wants the current to keep going to the right, it doesn't want it to decrease, so it's going to have a voltage going to the right. Again, you can convince yourself that to have a magnetic field going to the left as drawn, you would need the um, the induced or attempted to be induced current to, uh, to oppose that, so it's going to go to the right. Uh, if we have an increasing current to the left, that means you're going to have a magnetic field to the right, at least as drawn as this thing curls, and it's going to be increasing because the I is increasing. Well, an increasing magnetic field to the right is obviously a change to the right, and the induced magnetic field has to go to the left to oppose that change, and the E is going to go to the right. So interestingly, whether you have a current that's decreasing to the right or increasing to the left, the induced voltage and the induced magnetic field are going to be the same. Similarly, if you have a current that's going to the left and decreasing, it's going to have a, a magnetic field that's decreasing to the right. The change in that case is going to be to the left because going to the right but decreasing for the magnetic field is going to be the same as uh, going to the uh, opposite side and increasing. So the B induced has to oppose that, has to be opposite. Let me go here. So again, notice, I don't know, I'll give them letters. These two are similar, and these two have similar effects. So let's take a few minutes and talk about, well, how can we get uh, the self-induction of a solenoid? So there is a formula for a solenoid that will tell you the... Um, the self-induction. And let's go back to the definition of inductance. So before we get to inductance, remember capacitance is A over D epsilon naught. It's sort of almost like a length times epsilon naught. It's a measure of how much charge you get stored for a uh, given voltage. Inductance, on the other hand, and by the way, this formula is only for parallel plate capacitors. This is always true. Inductance, similarly, uh, generally, is, well, we don't have charge. Instead, we have magnetic flux. So I'm going to write this as N phi B, where if there's multiple loops, like in the case of a solenoid, the N is the number of loops that you have this flux going through. And that flux B is measured relative to the uh, area similar to uh, what's in this picture. and that's per current. So sort of like an amount of magnetic flux per current. Uh, magnetic flux, if you recall, uh, has units of Weber's per amp. Well, what's a Weber? A Weber, like magnetic flux, B dot dA, is Tesla meters squared. And normally we just call this a Henry.
So we have generically what inductance is, but how do we get a nice formula like this for a parallel plate capacitor? How do we get something similar for an inductor? Well, to put that together, one thing we need to remember is that the magnetic field for a solenoid, at least the magnetic field inside the solenoid, is mu naught little n i. Remember, this little n is uh, turns per length, so like turns per meter, typically. Uh, we also need to recall that magnetic flux is B A, or more accurately, the uh, vector for the magnetic field, the dot product of A, because it's only the component that's perpendicular to A, um, or parallel to the area vector that matters, the integral of that. Uh, that integral is not a closed surface. If it was, uh, it would actually add up to zero. That's one of Maxwell's equations. So we're only interested in the surface going through uh, sort of this circle here is all that we, uh, we care about. So let's put these things together. So L, now N is the total number of turns, that's capital N, which is really the same thing as if I was to take the turn density times the length. By the way, this distance is the length. We're talking about the, the length of the, um, the inductor itself. Sorry, I got interrupted there. Uh, so capital N is the same as the turn density times the length of the solenoid. Well, flux is, in this case, because nothing's changing, uh, meaning it's uniform throughout the area, it's just B dot A. Uh, B for a solenoid, we invoke this mu naught little n I times A over I. You can see that the L for a solenoid the I on the top and bottom cancel, the two ends multiply, and you're left with uh, mu naught, a constant, times n squared L A, which interestingly uh, looks similar to this in that it winds up being uh, a length times A. So n is turns per length, so that's like number over meters squared cancels out the meter squared from area and you're left with mu naught times L. Uh, similarly, if you look at mu naught, mu naught, uh, the permeability of free space is 4 pi times 10 to the times 10 to the minus 7 Henry's per meter and up here, epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space for the electric field was 8.854 times 10 to the minus uh, 12 farads per meter. So uh, one is sort of a measure of how well the uh, magnetic field propagates and the other is sort of a measure of how well the electric field operates or uh, propagates I should say. Okay, and finally, uh, just a, a word about uh, the power, or the, uh, I shouldn't say the power, the energy stored in an inductor. So imagine this is a battery and you just connect it. Current starts to flow. And what happens is energy gets stored in the magnetic field that's in here. Now, in another video, I, I go through deriving the uh, equation for the um, current in the inductor when we first connect this. But let's just look at this from the energy stored in the inductor. So if you start in the battery, the energy, oh, and there's got to be a resistor in here. The energy in the circuit goes two places. Some of it goes into thermal losses from the resistor, and some of it gets stored as a, a potential energy in the uh, magnetic field there. So some amount of that energy gets stored uh, or gets used up in the resistor and some amount of that gets stored in the magnetic field. So uh, in terms of uh, voltage drops, you have a voltage drop going through the resistor and you have another voltage drop across the inductor due to the back EMF, but that energy is not disappearing. It's just getting stored in the magnetic field. So if we want to look at power, you know, remember power equals IV, so EI 
equals I squared R, the thermal energy, uh, the rate of thermal energy losses, plus this now becomes L I D I D T. So let's look at this portion here. Uh, if this is your power, and we're only concerned with this portion, T I no, it should say D I D T. Sorry, it's getting a little late. So power dt equals, we're, we're just sort of ignoring this because we're only caring about the energy in the magnetic field, um, L I D I. Well, we're um, integrating this side, gives you the work, which is the energy stored in the magnetic field, which is really just taking the integral of L I D I from uh, zero to some final uh, current value. And wait a minute, we've seen this kind of thing before, like with springs that the force varies linearly. Um, so you went up with, well, the integral of i is one half i squared, so we're gonna get an energy here that is one half L i squared. So the energy stored in the inductor is one half li squared. So the more current you store in the magnetic, the more, um, the higher the final current, you wind up storing more energy. And that makes sense because it's a bigger change in the magnetic field, which is a bigger um, change in flux and, and, and all that. So this is the magnetic field stored in, or the energy stored in the magnetic field, which is very similar to with capacitors, we had uh, an energy that was uh, stored and was equal to 1 half C V squared. All right, so one more video. Hopefully that helps illuminate something. And uh, I am getting a little more tired, so I do apologize for any confusing explanations at this point.